Well, you've, uh, you guys have all heard the saying before, right? That um, you never know what you have until it's gone. You, you've heard that before? Um, I, I, here's my thing. I learned this several years ago. I discovered uh, that you never know how good you've got it until you're gone. Uh, I remember years ago when I left the South to go out West into California, which really felt like another country to me at the time. Uh, I don't know if you've ever traveled outside of the South, but uh, there, there are some cultural differences. Did you know that? There's just a few. There's a few. Uh, in case you didn't know this, other areas of the U.S. don't have the same experiences that we have here in the South. Uh, I wanted to talk about those for just a few seconds. Here are some of the differences. Some are good. Some are not as good. Uh, but like language is one thing, right? So I, I'm going to put this up on the screen. If there's one person, all right, singular, it's what? You, right? Now, if there are two people, it's y'all, right? Now, if you get outside of the South and say y'all, they're, they're not sure what you're talking about, right? But if there's three people, three or more, it's what? All y'all, right? What, what's interesting too is when you begin to break it down, like if you, again, if you wanted to use, um, if you wanted to use y'all, you know, you, uh, there, there's, other, there's other terms and, and words that we like to use. How about this one? Like if, um, if you're about to do something, we're fixing to do it. I remember the first time I got out west and I said, hey, somebody said, hey, would you run down to, you know, the shop and grab the tool? And I was like, yeah, I'm fixing to do it. They're like, fixing? Fixing? No, you need the tool to fix it. No, I'm not. No, I said, yeah, I'm fixing to go get it. Like, fixing. They just didn't get it. And of course, again, it's a language barrier. How about this one? Uh, honey, sugar, dumpling, pumpkin, and sweetie pie is not necessarily food. Okay? Like, right? In the South, that's sort of how we speak. And um, here's another thing that we all know, especially here in Georgia, when someone says, bless your heart, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing, right? <laughs> means, it probably means you're a moron, and one day you just might figure it out, right? How about this one? Here's some other things that are a little bit different for us in the South, um, like our food and our beverage is, is different than other places. Um, all soft drinks can be called Coke. Like, it, somebody may say, hey, do you want a Coke? And then you go, yes. And they go, well, what kind? You're like, wait a minute, I thought we were getting a Coke. Like, no, do you want a Sprite? Do you want a root beer? I mean, what do you want? That's all Coke. Now, I got out west, and again, same thing happened. Somebody said, hey, do you want a Coke? I said, yeah, get me a, a, a Sprite. And he was like, what? You just said you wanted a Coke. And again, it's just a thing that we say, I guess. How about this one? Uh, there is only, there's only, every good southern person knows this. There is only one type of tea. Sweet. Yeah. By the way, did you guys see Milo's just recently came out with a, like, the real Southern version? Like, they're sweet, and then, I, I don't know what they call it, I think it's like super sweet or something like that. It's just called Southern tea. That's, like, if, it's, if you can't double it as syrup on your pancakes, it doesn't qualify as tea, right? It's like, every time we go to the restaurant, my wife has to ask, how's your tea? And they're like, what do you mean, how's our tea? Like, how's your sweet tea? No, it was sweet. She's like, no, no, no. I mean, is it sweet? And the lady will go, yeah, I had to, you know, I had to take a shot before I drank it. So you're good. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, by the way, uh, the, we are speaking of sweet tea. When you go, um, when people come to the South, this is one of the only places where you can actually find unsweet tea. Not sure how that process works, that they put the sugar in it and then take it back out to make it unsweet. But there you go. Everywhere else you go, it's just tea right? Everywhere else you go, it's just tea. And by the way, if you go outside of the South and you ask for sweet tea, they're like, hey, we got iced tea. We'll bring you some sugar packets. Everybody knows that doesn't work either, right? It ain't going to work. All right, just go ahead and order you a Coke and then tell them which kind you want. <clears throat> some, uh, here's another one. Uh, some people are, are known to try anything. We are known to fry anything. Can I get amen? Like, I, I mean, we get chicken. Everywhere fries chicken. But we'll fry some stuff that you weren't so sure ought to be fried. Like, we can take a healthy thing and turn it into a very unhealthy thing. I mean, we're, we fry green beans for crying out loud. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, that's a vegetable. Let's fry it. It'll make it taste better. Um, anybody ever had fried cheesecake? Hey, let's take an unhealthy thing and just move it right on up to another level. Or fried Oreos. Anybody like fried Oreos? Yeah. Everybody's starting to get hungry now. <laughs> or uh, there's this thing where we take really good foods and we like mix them all together and we call it a casserole. That's right. Just take a lot of good stuff, put it together, put some Ritz crackers on top and you got yourself a casserole. 
and everybody's happy. Something else that we're all very uh, confident of and we know very well is that our weather here in the south is very different than other places. I mean, um, we don't need saunas in the south. You just got to walk outside. I mean, the humidity level is enough that you don't need one of those. Or how about this? Uh, if you like bugs, we got them. I mean, we got gnats during the day and we got mosquitoes at night. That's all you need. And uh, in, in 24 hours, and, and this legitimately happened last year, in 24 hours, you can go from swimming in your pool or out at the beach to sitting in front of a fireplace trying to warm yourself in 24-hour period. It happens. I mean, we have severe weather changes. Then, then there's the whole culture thing, right? So, I mean, I know all of these things, the language, the food, the, the, the uh, environment, I know it all comes with the culture thing, but there's a people culture, right? And we get it. And uh, I mean, listen, the South is the home of America, mullets, and manners. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got some nice hairdos that people like to engage in. Uh, we, are, uh, we are patriotic to our core. And then everybody's like, you know, we teach our kids manners. I mean, you go in other places and kids may not necessarily, necessarily say yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, or yes, sir, or no, sir. But we teach them here like, hey, mind your, mind your manners. Uh, it's also, uh, we're also famous for our, our love for NASCAR, right? I mean, uh, people down here in the South, anybody watch the Daytona race last week? Yeah, there's a couple of, yeah, there you go, man. It's all about it. Um, and then here's another thing, culturally that we get, uh, and if you've never been out of the, the Southeast in particular, um, you may not get this, but, but literally there's like a church on every corner. You, you go, you, drive, you don't have to drive far, and there's a church, and there's a church, and here's a church. I mean, it's like, how many churches are there? Well, this brings me to our point, uh, to a point this morning that I want to use to dive into the text. I mean, every good Southerner has their religion, right? It's God, sweet tea, and does anybody know? What'd you say? Fried chicken. Fried chicken. No, fried chicken. It's God, sweet tea, and the SEC, by God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it is. Like, we are all about, you know, some Southern, Southeastern Conference football. So we all have, in the South, we're known for our religion now, while I do love the South, part of our culture is concerning to me as a pastor. And the reason it is, is, is uh, many people think that their religion is going to do something for them. We think that our religious participation is going to do something for, for us. The problem is, is to be honest, I mean, our religious participation really actually does little for us. What do you mean by that? Like, why did we show up if it's doing little for us? Let me share with you some some things that religion can't do for you. Number one, religion cannot change you. It can only change your schedule. And I'm talking about religion, okay? Religion is not going to change you. It may change your schedule. What you do on Sunday morning it may change what you do on a Wednesday night. But it cannot change you. Religion cannot change you. Let me tell you something else religion can't do. Religion can temporarily make you feel better. But it cannot permanently clear your conscience. See, if you're trying to use Sunday morning and in church attendance as a way to try to make yourself feel better about you and decisions that you've made, it never will. You can't permanently get rid of it because it's always in the back of your head. You'll always be thinking about, man, I'm just a horrible person. I, I, I can remember back in, you know, we, we think of a year and a moment and a circumstance and a decision that we made and, and suddenly we feel the condemnation falling down upon us. And here's a third thing religion can't do for us. Religion can make you feel safe, but it cannot save you. Religion can make you feel safe, but it cannot save you. We see instances of that in, throughout the entire uh, Bible. We see that it, throughout Jesus' ministry here on earth, the people that Jesus had the biggest problem with were really the religious people, the ones who were trying to accomplish something through their works. You see, religion is man's effort to try and reach God. That's what religion is. Religion is our effort to try and somehow reach God. And it's an impossibility. And what we're going to see here in our text today is that the writer of Hebrews is attempting to convince some Jewish people, a group of Jewish Christians, to not go back to their old way of life, to not go back into trying to find God and reach God through their obedience to the law and the commandments under the old covenant that God had given them. 
And so again, just as a refresher, the writer is comparing in this passage of scripture, he's comparing the two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. And literally when we say Old Testament, New Testament, the word testament means covenant. It's the old covenant and the new covenant. He is comparing the two covenants because, again, the, 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 group, the group of Jewish Christians that were being drawn back to their old way of doing things in, a particular, in particular moving away from Christ and what Christ accomplished and back to attempting to work their way to God through the old covenant. So let's look in Hebrews chapter 9, verse, verses 1, first part of 2. Listen to what he says. He says, now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, and we're just going to kind of hang right there for a second. For a tent was prepared. So notice he points back to, he says, listen, even in the old covenant, they had these regulations for worship. They had these orders that they did. They had all these things that we do, that they would do when they would show up uh, for, for the worship meeting. And then he says, and there was a tent prepared. Now, in the tabernacle... Um, we're going to see here in a minute, there, there were, it was just a big tent. Uh, when, they came, when the Israelites were delivered by God out of Egypt, they went into the promised land. And when they got there, God uh, established a set of worship uh, regulations for them. Erect a tent, and there's, this, there's two compartments to the tent. So there's a larger part, and there's a smaller part. By the way, the tent would be not terribly big. You could fit, you could fit the tent of the meeting or the tabernacle in one half of a football field. And it wasn't nearly as wide. And so... The tent of the meeting had two compartments to it. And in one compartment, all, all the priests could go, but there was one part that we're gonna see here in a second that only the high priest could go. So we'll, we'll get into that here for a second. But the tent or the tabernacle was meant to be a shadow of things to come, right? The tent and the tabernacle, all of this stuff he's talking about was simply meant to be a shadow of things to come. It was to point people to Jesus and the new covenant that would eventually arrive with him. It was not meant to be the thing. It was just simply meant to point to the thing. Now, to give you an example or to illustrate this for you, it's like on Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving is one of my favorite days. It's because that's the one day that we can eat as much food as we want, not feel guilty about it, and then turn the TV on and watch football, okay? And so when you see on Thanksgiving, when you see your mom or your wife or your grandmother, or whoever it is in your family that does it, when you see them start putting stuff on the table, when you see the plates going on the table, and now we got a napkin with a fork and a knife and a spoon, when you see the table beginning to get prepared, it's not about the plates and the napkins and the forks, knives, and spoons. We know that when we see the table being prepared, we know that something's getting ready to happen pretty soon, and it's going to be pretty fantastic. Right? And so, just as... The table being set is not the thing. The thing is coming and it's meant to point to the fact that it's getting ready to happen and there's something more glorious that's beginning or that's about to take place. Now look in verse 2b. Let's look in the second half of 2. It says, for a tent was prepared. The first section, and here he's going to draw it out, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Now, there were, again, two sections to the tabernacle. Uh, the, the first section, so you entered in through the first curtain. When you entered in, he says, in that first section called the holy place were found the lampstand, the table, and the bread of presence. So what, what was this all about? Even everything, every detail inside of the tabernacle and the tent was to point us to the reality of what was to come. Again, it was a shadow of things. So the lampstand uh, was, it was like this candle auberic type thing and it had several places on it and they would fill it with oil and then it had a wick in it and they would light it and it would burn. And the reason they would do this, there were no windows in the tabernacle. So in order for the priest to go in and do their priest's duty, they had to go in and light the candle so that it would illuminate the place. It was to provide necessary light for the priest ministry in the holy place. The nation of Israel. What does all this point to? The nation of Israel in the Old Testament was supposed to be light for God to the nations. That other people would see Israel. And Israel would be obedient to the teachings of God. Israel would follow God daily. And through God would have all their victories over these nations that were more powerful than they were. And it was, they were simply meant to be a light to the rest of the world that God is God. Jesus Christ in John 8, 12 would, 
We would be told that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And then in Philippians 2, 14 and 15, it says believers are to shine. We are to shine as lights of the world. Everything in that tent of the meeting, everything in that tabernacle pointed to something that was to come, a new covenant. And so you and I, we are to be lights to the world. We are to illuminate the glory of God for the rest of the world to see, which is a reason why when we wrote our mission statement, we said, hey, our mission statement is to, that we want to bring hope to all people by inspiring them to desire a deeper relationship with Jesus. Inspirational means you see something, that I am reflecting the glory of God, that I am following Jesus, that people, when I live my life, when you live your life, that people, when they see us, would see Jesus and it would be a light to the world and they would be attracted to it like a moth to a flame. And then the second thing he listed here is the table And the bread of presence, or the show bread, as some translations may say. This table, inside of that first compartment, as soon as the priest would walk in, there would be a table to the right. And when they would walk in on it, um, it would be a table, and there would be 12 loaves of bread on the table. Each Sabbath, each Saturday, the priest would walk in, and they would take the old bread off, and they would put new bread on. And in in the tabernacle, the priest would then eat the bread that was old, okay? And it could only be consumed in the tabernacle. The old loaves would be eaten and only the priest could eat the bread and they were, again, required to eat it within the confines of that first section. It was meant to remind the people of Israel, the 12 loaves of bread was meant to remind the 12 tribes of God's presence that sustained them while they were in the wilderness. It was God's presence. That's why it's called, again, the table and the bread of presence. And it should remind us that Jesus Christ, he claimed to be the bread of life. Jesus Christ is the one who is going to sustain us in every walk of life that we encounter. Look in verses three through five. It says uh, behind the second curtain, so this is into this, uh, there's a second section called the most holy place or the holy of holies as you've probably heard it called before. In verse four, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot or we cannot now speak in detail. So this second section was the Holy of Holies. Now in this section is where the the high priest, only the high priest could go, and he could only go there one time a year. And so this this section in it had the golden altar of incense. The golden altar did not actually stand in the Holy of Holies. It was right, right as you went into the Holy of Holies. It was right there on the outside. And uh, its ministry was pertained to the Holy of Holies, even though wasn't set inside and, and here's the reason and here's what it was used for on the annual day of atonement the high priest when he would go in that one time a year used coals from this altar to burn the incense on the mercy seat or before the mercy seat within the veil Moses relates the gold altar to the ark of the covenant and so does the author of first kings if you go into first Kings 6 22 you'll see the reference there and each morning and evening a priest burned incense on this altar. And David, King David, suggests that this is a picture of prayer ascending to God. So when he would light it and the smoke would rise and the incense would rise and the smell would rise, that it was a picture of of prayers being lifted up to God. And for us, it's a reminder as we think about what does this mean for us as followers of Jesus Christ in the new covenant today, what that incense represents to us is that Jesus is always and constantly interceding on our behalf. I mean, how comforting is it to know that there's a couple of things that scripture tells us. Number one, when we pray, when we don't know what to pray, even when we don't know how to pray or what to pray, it says the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. And that Jesus... The Son of God is consistently and constantly praying for us and interceding for us. And God the Father is hearing all of these prayers. The Ark of the Covenant is also found in there. It was about uh, three feet, nine inches long. 
And it was um, two, it was, uh, it was three feet, nine inches long. It was two feet, three inches wide, and it was two feet, three inches tall. And it was, it was made out of wood, and then it was covered on all sides with gold. And inside the Ark of the Covenant that was found in the Holy of Holies was found three things. There was, uh, the, and, uh, there was an urn holding the manna from, uh, from the wilderness. And the manna was a reminder again of God's provision. God provided when there was nothing, when you, got, when you had no ability to get anything, God provided for the people in the wilderness. He would remember, if you remember the story, if you're from a church background, if not, um, basically what happened is when they got out there, they were afraid they were gonna starve. And then God said, hey, every morning when you wake up, I will provide for you bread. So you will pick up bread every single day, except the day before the Sabbath, you'll pick up enough for two days. Only get enough for a day. Don't get any more than that because every day I'm gonna provide for you. So in, in the Ark of the Covenant was manna. Why was that one of the things placed in there? Because God has provided for you, and we're gonna see what he provided for you here in just a second. The, another thing that was in there was Aaron's uh, budded staff. And what that represented was the authority of God. If you go back and read the Old Testament, there were uh, a, a lot of miracles that were performed with Aaron's rod. If you remember when um, the, the, the magicians or the, the, the people in Egypt laid their, they, had a, you know, they laid the snake down and then Aaron laid his staff down. It turned into a snake, ate their snake, and then kind of became a staff again. And there were several other miracles performed in the book of Exodus through Aaron's staff. And then there was a moment when um, some of the people in, uh, of the different tribes of Israel were changed challenging for leadership and so they said hey get all of the leaders of the 12 tribes together and tell everybody to bring their staff and when they did Aaron they they all said all right here's what we're going to do whoever staff uh, God told me to tell you whoever staff buds and blooms there that's that's the one who is the leader and so it was Aaron's staff that budded so it represented as a reminder of God's authority and then the tablets of the covenant which represented the standard by which we were to live they were placed in the ark of the covenant Here's, here's the law. This is, if you want to know what it means to be righteous and to earn your way into God's presence as if we could do that, here, here's the standard and you can't keep it. And so all of these things were listed or, or were put into uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And then on top, there was, a, there was a lid on it. And on the lid, on the cover, there was a cherubim. And at the top of this was this beautiful thing. And it was the mercy seat made of gold with cherub at each end. And this was the throne of God. This was the throne of God in the tabernacle. And one, one time a year, on the day of atonement, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat to cover the tables of the law within the ark. And God did not look at the broken law in that moment when, when, the, when the high priest would go in, he would go in twice a year, or uh, once a year, two times, once to offer a sacrifice for himself. And the second time he would go in, he was offering a sacrifice, of, a blood sacrifice for all of the people. And when he would go in, he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. And God did not in that moment see the laws that had been broken by the people. All he saw was the sacrificial blood of the animal. But here's the problem. That blood doesn't take away sin. It just covers it. Verses 6 and 7, look at what it says. In uh, verse 6 it says, The preparations... Having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. This is all of the priests. But into the second, only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. And there's, a, there's an interesting word in there, the unintentional sins of the people, meaning sin. <laughs> we have to be careful, right? Like we, when, we don't want our conscience seared when he tells us, hey, here's some things that you know, we're not to do. And we go, hey, I'm just going to do it anyway. That's not an unintentional sin. And so here, the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, um, this would cover the unintentional sins of the people. Verse 8, we'll jump into verse 8. Um, By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing. In other words, the only thing that the tabernacle did for the people was to constantly remind them, according to what we see in verse 8. It was to constantly remind them that they did not have access to God. So no people could go in there unless you were a priest. When you approached the tent, when you brought your sacrifices, when you brought you know, your, your offerings in order to um, 
be forgiven of your sins. When you brought all that stuff, you never got to go in and only the high priest got to go into the presence of God. And when he did, we've talked about this before, they had bells on the bottom of the robe. And so the bells were, if you heard those bells stop jingling, it meant he quit moving. And if he quit moving, it might be because God struck him dead. So they had a rope tied around his foot to pull him back out. And then next man up. And so he would, they would have, they had stuff and everything about the tent and the tabernacle everything about everything inside of it was meant to point us to something greater but when the people saw it under the old covenant all it did was remind them of the fact that they did not measure up and here's what it resulted in look in verses 9 and 10 Uh, Verse 9 begins with a parenthetical statement. He says, which is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect, watch this, the conscience of the worshiper. He says that, listen, all of these sacrifices, all of these things, it's not going to fix your conscience. They can cover your sins, but they can't do away with your sins. And if your sins are not done away with, then constantly in the back of your mind, every year you know that you're going to have to come back to this place. You're going to have to give your offering. You're going to have to give your sacrifice. And when you walk up, the only thing that you're going to be reminded of is you are not worthy to enter into the presence of God. Verse 10. But deal only, these deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of ref- reformation. So let's compare really quick the reference in 9a, that first part, that parenthetical statement, to the verse reference in verse 10. That, so you notice he uses in the first part of 9, which is symbolic for the present age, and then he goes on to say at the end, until the time of reformation, there's like these two time statements put into these verses. In verse 9a, he says that the outer tent with its furnishings and ministry separating the people from the holy of holies and the presence of God was symbolic of, he says, the present time. Then he says in verses 9b and 10 that these external rituals relate to food, drink, and washings and are valid only until the time of reformation. So the question is, when does that transition happen in history? And when does present time in verse 9 give way to the Reformation or the new order in verse 10? The whole point of the book of Hebrews, and this is, again, this is what he's pushing at, is to say that the coming of Christ, when Jesus came, when he died, when he gave his life as a sacrifice, an atonement for sin, when he died on the cross, when he was resurrected from the dead, all of these things, the coming of Christ, the Son of God into the world is the ending of the present time, of the old, the old covenant, of the strange foreign way that people had to relate to God back then. That was the end of it. And the beginning of the Reformation where Christ himself replaces the high priest. There's no high priest that has to go into a holy of holies again every year. He replaces the temple and the blood of the animals and the food and the drink rituals. That's the point of the whole book of Hebrews. Now, look in verses 11 through 14. So now he's gonna tell us. Listen to this, we're just gonna read straight through. But... When Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. You don't have to go back every year and make a sacrifice. Jesus has satisfied that. For if the blood of goats and bulls, in verse 13, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify, watch this, our conscience from dead works to serve the living God, the writer of Hebrews is trying through the imagery of the tabernacle and the furniture and the placings of things inside the tabernacle and of the sacrificial system, he is trying to show them that Jesus is better. So in other words, don't go back to the old system. Quit trying to work your way to God. Jesus has come and he has provided a better way for you to relate to God, for you and for me. And so I talked about in the beginning of the service. So I want to, these things, I want to add something to it. So religion cannot change you. It can only change your schedule. 
If all you do is show up on a Sunday and you pursue Jesus not the rest of the week, that's religion. It's not going to change you. It will change your schedule, but it's not going to change who you are. It's not going to change who I am. Religion can temporarily make you feel better, but it cannot permanently clear your conscience. That's what the writer of Hebrews was pointing at. So if, you're, if you struggle, if you're struggling with the things that the enemy would say to you that consistent and constant beating, like you failed, you messed up, you can't do it, you're never going to do it. If we say, oh, no, 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 I'll do it. I'm just going to start going to Sunday school more and showing up to church more regularly and, and I'll start giving more. If you think you can earn your way back to God and clear your conscience that way, it's an impossibility. But the minute that we place our faith in Christ and the minute we allow Jesus and through the Holy Spirit to, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our, our minds in that moment, then he can cleanse our consciousness. Forgiveness, forgiveness can set you free. And then the last thing I said at the beginning was religion make you feel safe. I mean, how many people, listen, when 9-11 happened, man, church is filled up. When COVID happened, in the beginning, before everybody said, oh, no, 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 let's not be around a bunch of other people. When COVID first started, um, like, making the airwaves on the media, everybody started trying to search for God in order to find answers to COVID. See, we can, religion, we pursue it to try to make us feel safe. Some people pursue religion because they, they do believe in, a, in life after death and they believe in a heaven and a hell. And so the options are, do I want to go to heaven or hell? No, I don't want to go to hell. So what I'm going to do is through religion, pursue my way of earning my way into heaven and into God's presence. Religion. Let me tell you something else religion will do. Religion will cause us not to love Jesus. Only what he can do for us. I mean, religious people, you look back in the New Testament, even again, I said before, the, the people who gave Jesus the hardest time were the religious people. They didn't love God. They only loved what God could do for them and the power that they felt they had as, their, as part of their uh, position in God's kingdom. See, religion will cause us not to love Jesus, only what he can do for us. I had this conversation recently with a friend of mine. We were having this sort of uh, theological conversation about when Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all your strength. Baptists, we are known as a, a people of the word. Like we, we dig into the word. And so we're, we're big on the intellectual side of understanding what the word of God teaches so we can feel like I intellectually know what I'm supposed to do with this. But see, I, I believe that what the word of God is teaching us is that when he says you should love the Lord your God, I think that's an affection. And here's the reason that I say that. So like religion will cause us not to love Jesus, but only what he can do for us. But as we have, again, seen through the eyes of the writer of Hebrews, it'll only leave you empty. But when we, when we think about our love and affections for Jesus, so let me give you this illustration, Okay. My wife, I'm in love with my wife, okay? Now, there is a, there is a rule in the Old Testament, in the, in the law, in the Ten Commandments, there's a rule. You shall not commit adultery. That's a rule. That rule is not the reason that I don't cheat on my wife. See, that's, that's like a religious approach to, like, look, legally I'm married to you, I shouldn't cheat on you, and that's what the rules say, so I'm not going to cheat on you. My love for my wife is what compels me to go, like, look, every other woman on the planet is off limits because I got one woman that I love. So my love for her compels me to go, I'm faithful to you and to you alone. I don't need a rule to tell me to be faithful to my wife. My love for her does that for me. And then Jesus would say this. Jesus said, remember this statement? He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so I always grew up, uh, you know, like at least my, my early days in church when I was in my early 20s, I always would read that rule and it felt like this, hey, look, if you love me, you will prove your love to me by, by being obedient to my commands. And I, I have since discovered um, that what God is probably teaching us is that if you love me, if, if your heart's for me, if you, if you just love everything about me and you want to be in my presence and you want me in your presence, just like I love my wife, doesn't, 
Like, I don't need a rule to tell me not to cheat on my wife. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Why? Because your love for me, you won't be thinking about the rules. You'll just be thinking about, I love Jesus. And I, I want to honor him. I want to follow him. I want my love for him to be evident to everyone. I don't want people to have to guess whether or not I'm married to my wife. Like they should know because we're together and how we behave together. And the same thing should be said of Jesus. That if we're followers of Jesus, our behavior, how we follow him, how we love him, how we display actions for him, which is why to me worship is such a big deal. Doesn't mean everybody has to worship the same way, but in your heart, if your affections are not stirred when we sing these songs, man, I gotta wonder, like where, where is your love relationship with Jesus at? Here's the interesting thing is that we know of. In the, in the Gospels, it says that when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake, and it says that the veil, this veil was like three inches thick, like cloth. You ain't cutting it, you ain't tearing it. So when I, I said earlier that religion is man's effort to try and reach God, the veil was not torn from the bottom up. The, the scriptures tell us that the veil was torn from the top down. See, Religion is man's effort to try and reach God. Christianity is God's effort and attempt to reach man. You and I, we could not make our way to God, but God came to us. And then when he did, when he had paid the sacrifice, when it was, when it was over and done with, he tore the veil. That would have been the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else. And now for the first time, everybody who, as faith in Christ, everybody who trusts in Jesus by faith, trusts in the sacrifice that he made, not of bull and goats, but of the Lamb of God, once you have trusted in that, now, instead of having to have a priest go in on your behalf, you now have full access to God. Religion is man's effort to try and reach God. Christianity is God's attempt to reach man. There's a guy named Blaise Pascal. He wrote, uh, he had some writings called the Pensees. And here's what Blaise Pascal said. This is, I thought this was very interesting. And I think it's a very interesting uh, quote for us to entertain today. Blaise Pascal, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof. So many people today are walking around trying to figure out, hey, can, I, can you prove God to me? Can you prove God to me? Or even us sometimes in our search for God, we're going, okay, God, if you're real, you'll answer my prayer. God, if you're real, show me a sign. Blaise Pascal said people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. How we doing? First of all, question for you. How attractive, how attractive do you find your Savior? Second question. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, if we call ourselves followers of Christ, are we living our lives in such a way like the lampstand in the holy place? Are we living our lives in such a way that our light is shining before men and people see it in such a way that they become attracted to it? Because people, as Blaise Pascal said, don't arrive at their beliefs based on knowledge and what they know and what can be proven, but what they find attractive. Where's your attraction to Jesus? Where's that at today? And then, are we living our lives in such a way that other people would say that Jesus is attractive to them? That following Jesus, that way of life is attractive. Because I'll tell you today, and I hope all of you know this experientially, there is not a greater life that can be had than one of following and knowing and loving Jesus. There's not a better life. You can go try to find it out there any way you want. You can go try to find it through the internet. You can go try to find it through stuff that you purchase. You can go try to find it through other people, but you will never ever be satisfied. You will never have your conscience cleansed and you will never ever find the kind of love that God intended for you to have in any other thing. It's only in Jesus.